All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the Research Program Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, and I will be your host for today. Um, if you are new to these events, they are hybrid events. So that means we have folks online and we have folks in the room. So welcome to you both. For folks that are online, if you have any technical issues, we have a volunteer in the room, Roseanne. Thanks, Roseanne. Um, you can put in any of your questions about technical issues into the chat and she will interrupt us and make sure we get those taken care of. Um, also, if you have any questions for our presenter today, if you put those into the chat, we'll get to them at the end. For folks in the room, make sure you sign in so we can get a good head count of how many people are here. Um, and then if you have questions, we'll get to those at the end as well. We'll work with handing around a mic so that folks online can hear. I um, wanted to do a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we have for next week's seminar um, on February 23rd, Emily Idem, am I saying her last name right? Okay, um, is an assistant professor um, with COS that's going to be here talking to us about sediment dynamics in the Arctic coast um, and continental shelf. So these two events uh, have some themes that are related. And um, I also wanted to promote we have a Science on Tap coming up on March 23rd. People in the room, are you getting a weird echo from the mic? Okay, great. <laughs> um, on March 23rd, our next Science on Tap is going to be with Josh Stewart, um, is gonna be talking about his marine mammal work. So should be able to send out an announcement around that in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for that. But for today and why everyone's here and everyone's online is um, for our speaker. Our speaker was invited by Megan, who is part of um, the, I'm going to forget Megan, College of Engineering, um, but here at uh, Hatfield. Um, and uh, she's going to introduce today's speaker. I'm first. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Yeah, so our speaker for today is Professor Merrick Haller. He has been at Oregon State University for 20 years, or close to 20 years. Um, Merrick works on all different types of coastal processes, uh, including remote sensing, and he's going to share some of his work on that today, as well as some work more broadly in a, a larger project we have going on in uh, the School of Civil and Construction Engineering at OSU. Um, Merrick really enjoys cliff jumping. <laughs> and um, he's been a great mentor to me uh, since I've been at Oregon State. So there you go. Are you on your own? Thank you, Megan. Um, and thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks uh, for having me in this lovely venue and this lovely building on our lovely Oregon coast. Uh, it's always great to be out here. Um, and as Megan said, I am in the School of Civil and Construction Engineering. I am a coastal engineer by trade. Um, I am also appointed in the College of Oceanography and COS because a lot of what I do is really would be, my research would be considered nearshore oceanography. And what I wanna to talk to you about is a large collaborative project that has, it's about one year into this project. Um, I have a number of collaborators on it. Um, the title of the talk here is, is really re refer referencing one part of it, which is modeling uh, that's going on right here in our backyard. Uh, but I'm gonna cover some of the other aspects too. Um, and I just wanna point out ahead of time that um, I will be speaking of, about other people's work. So by definition, I won't be the expert there. I'm just gonna try to uh, do it justice. And I think it's all of um, some interest because it's all very focused here, uh, Oregon Pacific Northwest. Um, and what I'm talking about is this big umbrella project. So there's the full title of it. Um, the point is, is that the project is research funded by the US Army Corps of Engineers. And the Army Corps of Engineers nationally has done a lot of work, you know, forecasting hurricanes in the Gulf and on the East Coast. What are the surge levels going to be? How much flooding total water levels? And um, they've really built up uh, operational system for forecasting those things. 
but always concentrated on the Gulf and East Coast. And so what's new about this is um, they wanna build up that capability here on the West Coast, not just the Pacific Northwest, but the whole West Coast of the United States. And uh, the processes are different. They can't just take those models and just plan them down over here and, and make forecasts um, because the West Coast is different from those other coasts, right? We're more complex, rocky, um, uh, shorter shelf, all those things are different. So we've been tasked to help them with that. Um, and it's not just uh, flooding and total water levels, but there's also what's gonna happen to the dunes and what's gonna happen. Can we make predict predictions and projections uh, based on climate change uh, decades in the future? So that's, that's a big topic uh, and I'll dig into a few aspects of it. I just wanna point out there's a lot of people involved, not just me, I don't even, this isn't even the complete list. Um, and it's different colleges and different departments at OSU. So the part uh, that I'm mostly involved in is the modeling part for the total water level. So when we think about what happens during a storm, uh, and things that can affect the total water level at the shoreline. Um, we have the wind blowing. So there's some wind surge possible. It's, it's a extra tropical storm. It's got low pressure in the center uh, that will raise up the water level as it comes to shore. There's a lot of rain and river discharge that affects the total water levels. Um, obviously the tides are going up and down and there can be other things called non-tidal residuals or things that are not tides themselves, but changes in the water level due to large scale coastal ocean processes. So all of those things factor here on the West Coast, you know, but it's a, it's a different mix is, than you find on the other coasts. So we're trying to uh, nail down which of these are most important uh, that affect our total water levels, and then can we forecast them? How do we do that? Okay, so it, it's a big lift. This is, for example, a piece of how it's done uh, in the Gulf and on the East Coast. And what you're seeing here in these colors, uh, are you seeing how uh, the wave models are um, organized? And so those colors represent how much computing power is applied and it's, you can see there's, it's a patchwork. And so you have to make intelligent choices of where to concentrate your resolution um, based on you know, what's going on in that part of the ocean um, and how to devote your resources. And it's a big uh, area to be simulating, right? That's a large part of the earth. So it takes a lot of computational power, um, but it starts with uh, the waves and the waves are driven by the winds. And so model, for example, that we're implementing is called WaveWatch 3. So it's a model that forecasts uh, the directions and frequencies and wave heights uh, of the waves out in the open ocean and how those change as storms come to shore. When they come to shore, we then, uh, we then allow them to interact with the circulation and drive currents. We have the tides going up and down, depending on what time of day the storm arrives. All of those things go into those simulations. So uh, there's a lot of pieces to that. It's You have to set up a grid where you're forecasting the tides all along the West Coast. You gotta have bathymetry. You have to know what it looks like, the underwater topography. Um, and there's uh, a lot of time and effort. Those things aren't just grab and go. There's uh, a lot of effort goes into making those uh, accurate and functional. And then this would kind of describe what that whole system, all the different pieces that go into such a system. So uh, at the end of the day, your, your water levels are output here in the center. Let me get a laser pointer maybe. Right, all these pieces are feeding into that. So you need to take winds, you need to model waves across the large Pacific scale ocean. You need to bring that in into nested grids where you're focusing on specific parts of the coast. The, uh, those waves will then drive currents close to shore. They will also 
if they're large and we have a lot of wave breaking, we're going to have um, what we call setup or higher water levels due to the waves themselves. We got river discharge and we got the tides. So a lot of different pieces that have to be tested and implemented for our coast. Things are a little bit different. So what's interesting, uh, what are the interesting little aspects about what goes on here in the Pacific Northwest that is different from other places uh, in the US? Um, there's what we're looking at here is um, waves during storms up and down the coast and um, water levels uh, within the inlets. Uh, at the end of the day, what we have here is waves playing a bigger role than they do in other places because of our short shelf. And so the wind driven surge, uh, not as much as like the Gulf of Mexico, which is a very shallow basin and you get a lot of wind driven surge. Uh, waves are important and the waves are complicated. And what I mean by that is, if I click this off again and we come here, so here's um, some previous simulations before this project started, but work done at OSU uh, about wave transformation here off the Oregon coast. And I mentioned it's rocky and complicated and there are, are um, rocky banks out there that um, can focus the waves. And so what you're looking at in this figure, these colors represent wave height and you're running in a uniform wave height towards the shore and is being affected by the underwater topography. And the fact that there's these red streaks heading to shore are concentrations of wave energy where the energy is being focused at certain points on the coast. You know, and that those points on the coast, it'll depend on which direction the waves are coming from offshore and you know, can move up and down. But the fact of the matter is, is we have to be um, we have to be um, including all of that complicated underwater topography in the model simulations in order to get those wave changes right. Some things even closer to shore here, this is right in our backyard. So what we're looking at here is, this is uh, Newport and those are the jetties, as you see there. And you see the rocky reef that's attached to the north jetty. And then you see a red circle there that's kind of a footprint of a remote sensing uh, image that we're collecting all the time. And this is a radar image. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, uh, what that system is in a second, but it captures things like the waves coming to shore. And then it also demonstrates some of these um, larger scale features like rip currents and flows that come out of the jetties. And this is a movie that will play If I do it correctly, where is the pointer? There it is. Okay, so we're looking at um, uh, Nye Beach, basically north of the jetties. And what you're seeing are uh, things coming off the beach, these uh, red smoke puff looking aspects. These are rip currents that happen all the time on Nye Beach and they interact with that reef and, and they shoot out through gaps in the reef. So this is, uh, it happens during large wave events. And so um, these are circulation patterns that we would wanna be capturing uh, at, when we model extra tropical storms as they come to shore. What is that? So I'll just do a little sidebar because this wasn't specifically funded by the Army Corps of Engineers, but in fact, this is, funded by NANUS, our local Northwest um, uh, Integrated Ocean Observing System. And it's uh, a Coast Guard Tower right there in Yaquina Bay. On top of it is our radar. And there's a photo of that right there in the middle. And it's overlooking the inlet and it's capturing these images that I was just showing you. And I just wanna point out that uh, this data is available in real time. You can go on the web, this website that's listed here, if you wanna see any of this. And for example, what are we doing with it? One of the things we do with it is we uh, track the waves in space and time, and we can use that to estimate what the underwater topography looks like. So I mentioned underwater topography being important for the model simulations. 
Well, we can monitor it to a degree uh, over this sort of um, scale with this system. And so what you're seeing is in the middle, um, those tracks, those horizontal lines are bathymetric survey lines that my colleague Peter Ruggiero collects. And then on the right-hand panel, you're seeing the bathymetric map that we estimated. And this is how we kind of ground truth what we're doing with the remote sensing. Um, it's very hard to get out there and measure that topography. You can jet skis, you can only do it in the summer, but with this remote sensing system, uh, we can do it a lot more frequently. If you go on the web page, you can play around a little bit. You can choose um, historical data and kind of flip through recent images, whether it's a snapshot or there's some other data products. I can overlay the bathymetry on it, uh, the latest bathymetry with some buttons over there on the right. And we also use it to process just the wave information in particular. So these three rectangular boxes here are areas of the ocean that we um, compute wave information at in real time um, every day. And so wave directions and wavelengths, um, and they're different in the different boxes, right? Because our coastline is so complicated and uh, the waves aren't uniform along shore. Um, moving back now to our modeling project. Um, so what we call it is our local model test bed. So it's this region here, it spans uh, uh, all the way down to Alsea Bay. And so you have our engineered Uquina Inlet there in the top, and you have Alsea Bay uh, unengineered there on the bottom. And so it's this sort of scale that we're calling our test bed. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you, we're showing that the grid actually goes up into the estuaries. So we are, you know, the idea is to be able to forecast water levels all the way up into the estuaries during these extratropical storms. So we have to include that in our model. A good thing is since there's so much oceanographic work that goes on out here, we have a lot of data that we can use to compare to. So whether it's uh, the OOI data that you probably have heard about um, that's being collected all the time, um, there's been historical field experiments. This is kind of the wave buoys. There's the Marine Energy Center uh, sites out there where a lot of wave information is collected. Uh, the local tide gauge. I showed you the marine radar. We have this large suite of observations that's really going to help us um, first calibrate and test the modeling effort um, so that we can use it for forecasting. And uh, there's been a lot of great student and postdoc work on this. I don't have all the latest results, but just for one example of an early comparison of, you know, are we getting the tides right here in the channel where, of course, the currents are very strong. And we have um, some historical data there that my colleague Jim Lurzak collected. And we're showing that um, we're, uh, we're at least getting the tides right there. Um, and the waves during a certain stretch here, uh, again, um, it, it's a short time period and there's a lot more data we can compare to, but uh, we're starting to spin it up and it's, it seems like it's working pretty good. Um, another local consideration that they really don't have in the East Coast and Gulf as much as we do here is what we call infragravity waves. And so you've probably heard of sneaker waves right? Uh, hopefully. Um, so sneaker waves are a kind of infragravity wave. Uh, the idea is basically it's these very low frequency uh, water level changes, waves that run up and down on the beach, uh, not on the 10 second time scale, but on a few minutes kind of time scale. So we call them long waves. And we have a lot of them here, right? That's why sneaker waves are, are a hazard. And this plot here on the left is showing you just illustrating uh, that um, uh, the ramp up in infragravity wave energy as we come to shore. And so what you're looking at is uh, energy uh, on this axis and frequency on the x-axis, the horizontal axis. And so offshore, the big blue peak there is saying there's a lot of that day, there was a lot of wave energy coming to shore. And then when you get close to shore and you look at the spectrum at, at the shoreline, that's the green line see how all the energy is shifted to the left-hand side 
That's where those long waves that I'm talking about. So in order to get total water levels right here on the West Coast, we have to be including these kinds of contributions in the modeling. And the wave model that I talked about, the Wave Watch 3 that's modeling the waves across the ocean, they don't predict these waves. That's something we need to um, help get, get into these simulations. That's part of the work. Another aspect is the complicated topography. I showed you how the wave focusing happens for those banks that are far offshore. We're really interested in the effect of the Aquina Reef. Um, and so that's this, we're uh, focused studies, we're focusing part of our study into this area here. And we know there's some gaps in the reef and there's the reef itself. And how big of a role does that play in the wave conditions and in the long waves and sneaker wave band of the spectrum? Does it have a role or not is an open question that uh, we don't know the answer to yet. But that'll be part of what we're doing. It's not just a modeling study. We're putting instruments out in the ocean as well. Uh, we did a pilot study last fall um, where we put uh, an array of wave buoys across the reef. And they're not just wave buoys, but also pressure sensors. So from a pressure sensor record, like you see here in the second panel, you see that that's the tidal signal. And then the little blue burst on there represent the waves over the tidal signal. And we take that, we use it to analyze the wave transformation over the reef and um, try to assess this, its impact. Uh, we'll kind of skip through that. Um, okay, so there's this large scale wave modeling that we're doing, but now there's some more focused aspects to it as well. We can, so in the, for this infragravity sneaker wave study, what we do is we take a different model, a model that's more capable of, of simulating those kind of waves, we're not trying to do the whole ocean anymore. We're just trying to do uh, Nye Beach, but what we want to do is use those kind of um, mo models with a lot of wave physics in it to study the infragravity transformation there, and if we can characterize it accurately by comparing it to data, and we say, all right, now we kind of understand what those infragravity waves are doing here, then the idea is, is how do we tell the large-scale model how to get those right when it's simulating the total water levels and, and the waves uh, over the larger domain. So in other words, how do you parameterize uh, what's going on with the infragravity waves and get it into the, the larger scale models for forecasting? So that's part of the reason why we collected that data across the reef. It's gonna give us something to compare to and, uh, and tell us if the, if how capable the models are of simulating it. Okay, uh, I'll keep moving. Again, I, there's a number of tasks under this project. The test bed was one of them. At the end of the day, um, how do you make forecasts far into the future? I don't mean like what's going to happen when the next storm comes, but how about 10 years or 20 years from now? You can't do it by... Um, you know, modeling the whole 20 years. You need to move to more what we call statistical ways of simulating the waves and currents and water levels. And so that's what this task two is all about. My, uh, my colleague, Peter Ruggiero is leading this part. I won't read all the details of it, but it, it, in a nutshell, it's how do you, um, in order to reduce the computational complexity, how do you create statistical models that can be used for longer term forecasting as opposed to what we would call deterministic um, short term modeling like I've been talking about up till now. How does that work? Um, okay, it's pretty sophisticated, but in a try to boil it down into a nutshell, um, all right, the first step is, is you try to boil the weather into, down into some categories. And so um, the way he describes them is there's the annual weather types, 
interannual weather types, and then there's the day-to-day -day weather types. So you make these categories, annual weather might represent the transition, are we in a La Nina, are we in an El Nino, are we in between, um, down to the daily weather type is like, is it a summer high pressure system or is it a winter storm, you know, a day to day. And you make those categories of potential weather forcing, and then you associate them with what, what kind of waves do they make. And so again, you have a matrix of waves associated with a matrix of weather types. And then you say, all right, I need, as I go forward into the future, what are the probabilities of any one of those weather types happening? And then creating those, any one of those wave conditions and in what order um, and basically building up uh, a statistical representation of how things might progress over the next many, many years. And um, the point of doing all that is then now you have kind of a, uh, instead of having to simulate the next 20 to 30 years, you have 10, 20, 30 um, different representations that give you uh, what might happen not all the way to shore, but at the boundary of your wave model. So it's building up storm boundary conditions that we can use to then plug into our, um, our spectral wave model and our total water level forecasting. Okay, so it's generating the, the boundary conditions for these high fidelity models here in the floor. And, um, and then we can see what they say, uh, all the different scenarios. Uh, forecast into the future. That's where we're going. There hasn't been much work done on this other than um, we know what pieces we need to put together, but we haven't applied them to this problem uh, just yet. And then the last task that I'll cover here, uh, which is, um, as you can see there, Megan Wengrove is the leader on this task, and so she can correct me when I go off track here. But um, the point here is that it's not just hydrodynamics, there's also what's going on on shore. And so, for example, uh, in our Oregon coastal dune systems, and um, it's the, about the impact of the vegetation in the coastal dune systems. So um, uh, I'll get into the details of how the vegetation might affect the dunes, but in a nutshell, we want to best understand how they are affecting the stability of the dunes. We want to be able to, again, put together a type of forecasting model that can accurately simulate what they do and then forecast into the future what different, um, for example, management strategies, uh, what sort of effect they'll have as we go forward. Um, okay, so there's a kind of a cartoon of what uh, the beach looks like in cross section, and you can see that there's vegetation on the dune, and the idea is that the vegetation uh, actually helps the dunes grow and stabilizes them. Uh, but the long term story is that we used to, uh, Oregon didn't have uh, so many vegetated dunes before. It used to be more open and shifting sand out there, but there was a conservative effort in the 1900s and the 1930s to bring in some dune grass to help stabilize the dunes. So the, um, the different species are listed there. I won't try to pronounce them, but I believe the first one is a basically a European dune grass, and the second one is an American uh, beach grass, but not native to Oregon. Um, and they were brought in to stabilize the dunes. And in fact, they did. That was helpful, except for the fact that those beach grasses are not native and they're actually um, invasive. And so this kind of illustrates that with photos. Here's what, the, um, what it looked like in 1930. Right, and obviously it's more developed here as well, but it's also more vegetated and, um, and it helped 
So now we have a lot of the coastline has this uh, foreshore vegetated dune situation. The two beach grasses behave differently. Uh, the European one uh, allowed the dunes to grow higher and the American beach grass a little bit lower. Um, so they have different sand capturing ca characteristics. And, um, uh, but they both were better than the native. However, the ones that we brought in were invasive and are starting to take over. So can we incorporate that, that process into our models for forecasting uh, morphologic change is the question. And what she's put together is um, uh, a garden test bed. This is up in Halem. And the idea there is to plot the different beach grasses uh, and the native in individual plots and then observe how they grow and affect the dunes. Measure the winds, measure rate of dune growth. Um, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, experimental measurements to be taken there, uh, measuring um, rate of growth of the vegetation. One of the tools they're using is uh, so this is uh, Rebecca Edgel's work is working with Peter Ruggiero, uh using a drone to can you instead of having to measure the vegetation by hand, can you use remote sensing to come in and capture um, the level of growth? And that's what this is kind of illustrating. Really, the histograms there on the bottom are the fact that they look similar is the good result. It's that if you count it by hand, that's the left hand um, histograms. And then can we build an algorithm where we can do it using a drone? is uh, what the right-hand histogram is showing. And then the final plot there on the right is showing that those two things agree with each other. Um, so that's now a more efficient technique um, to capture what's going on in the garden. Um, this is just kind of a, a cartoon illustration of how it all works, right? So. Uh, and the, by the way, the modeling that has to happen here now is different from what I was talking about before. Now it's about uh, taking a wind field, putting sand and sediment in there, putting in the different types of beach grass, and ideally predicting how they capture sand. And before the project started, uh, there was no accounting for the different types of beach grass. There's one standard way of doing it. And it's actually, you know, um, not super accurate. So the idea is, is can we model that better? And that's what this slide is showing here. So this kind of shows you what a model setup would look like. You know, um, you've got the vegetation represented in there. You've got a layer of sand. You've got a wind field that's reasonably accurate, right? It's uh, in the boundary layer. That red line is showing how you know, the wind speed increases as you go up in the vertical and the amount of sand that might be accreting within the vegetation field. And then these are some of their early simulations with the different uh, types of beach grass listed in there down here at the bottom of the legend. And there's, you know, what the models, the simple models, the way they were characterized is the red line and then the new and improved versions for the different types of beach grass. And the idea is, look, they are different. It matters to account for um, the details uh, of how the um, different species capture the, the sand differently. Um, so that's pretty exciting and uh, moving forward steadily. And uh, there are other, there's a few other tasks that I haven't covered within the large project. Um, but I won't get into them now in the interest of time. And I just want to say that, um, uh, you know, I think this it's great that the Army Corps is seen fit now to invest more in the West Coast studies and West Coast processes. I'm glad this has come to Oregon and Oregon State. Um, I think uh, another great thing about it is that we really are focused uh, right now here in Oregon. So 
Um, it's in our backyard, and so I think it's relevant to all of us. And uh, again, the project's ongoing, so I'll be happy to share more results as we uh, continue to work through it. Uh, but with that, I think I'll wrap up and just thank you all for your time. Also Wonderful. happy to take any questions. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so for folks online, go ahead and put any questions you might have into the chat and I'll pause here. Roseanne, anything coming in yet? Okay, um, how about questions in the room? There we go. Francis. Uh, thanks for sharing that. That that's great to see. Wow, that's cool. Uh, so you, you you highlighted that um, topography affects waves, but waves also affect topography. Um, it, it, what's the scale that where those feedbacks might be important as we kind of envision kind of future responses? Yeah. So it, well, it depends on what kind of sediments we have and what kind of wave conditions. But for example, what I was talking about first was really far offshore, and rocky. I wouldn't expect the waves to be affecting that at all. But as we get in closer to shore, and we think about the reef and the area between the reef and the shoreline, this is where waves are gonna have an effect on that. Um, uh, you know, Again, the rocky parts, I'm not expecting to be affected, but I expect the sand to move around. And uh, I mean, we know it does. Um, I didn't speak to that because that's the hardest thing to start putting in. And, you know, this is the thing is, um, and this is why it's important to measure bathymetry all the time, because it's always shifting. Um, so uh, where I think it should go is, and, and where it's going on the East Coast uh, and Gulf simulations of hurricane stuff, is um, that it's really important to get the dry beach topography and the houses. And um, those things are always changing. But when the big storms come, um, you you got to get that right. We're not there yet here. OK, questions in the uh, online. Yes, we have one question. Super interesting. How much effort is there in modeling the sources and supplies of onshore subtidal versus intertidal or supertidal supplies. Sand moves offshore in winter and onshore in summer. How much of the sand budget is that? Um, okay, so to repeat, we're not actually modeling that yet, but also that's a great point. Uh, it's moving offshore in the winter, onshore in the summer. And I, I guess I'm going to tell you, I think that's super important too. And I'm, we want to include that eventually. Um, do we, it's also not, um, it's not a solved problem either. So we can start putting sediment transport and we can start moving, the, have the models move that stuff around. Uh, but the models aren't that great yet. So that's just, that's, what a lot of researchers in my field are still trying to push forward. We, we haven't solved that problem yet. All right, we've got questions in the room. Thanks, Mick. So how does your model bring in the 30, 40 centimeters of sea level change from say El Nino or other things that are from very far away? Yeah, well, we haven't brought that in yet. Right now it's ADSERC and it, we're just doing the tides. Um, but we will have to couple it with the coastal ocean model of some sort to get that part right. Um, so, yeah, great point. <laughs> we'll get there one day. Uh, and you're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other thing to think about is just how much resources they've thrown at doing this on the West Coast and the Gulf. And uh, we're just getting started here. But, yeah. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, with your test model, the 50 kilometer wide and from Newport down to Walport and uh, kind of following on Francis's, you know, the seafloor is important and it changes. How well is that box mapped with the sea from, from a seafloor perspective? I know it's in a, in a shipping channel and it's got, you know, nearshore map, but there's kind of a 
seemingly a gap between like the shelf break and then the near shore. There is. There absolutely is. And so there's the parts that don't change much. If you go out deeper than 20 or 30 meters, then your bathymetry is probably pretty good. Um, this, that's the Army Corps has to survey the channel every year because what's going on in the inlet is moving around the most. And so it's always out of date. Um, and we're trying to contribute to it with what we're doing with the remote sensing, at least over that footprint where we can mo uh, monitor it more frequently. Um, but, you know, we've, we're always um, data starved close to shore. It's important and it's, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to be able to get it as frequently as we need to. Not only that, once it changes, then you got to go in and you got to put it back in the model, right? And every time you change the bathymetry in the model, the model gets unhappy with, and you got to futz with it and so and fix it. I mean, you don't know how much effort goes into getting a model to run because of those grid issues and those boundary issues. It's like, it's literally more than half the work to, to get that right. And then now you got to update it. Okay. Things should just stay the same. Yeah. <laughs> Could someone? <laughs> All right. Any questions online, Roseanne? Any more questions in the room? Hey, Mick, Jack, again. So how are you going to put this on that fancy NVIDIA computer that's come on our way? Um, we're just going to put it right on. <laughs> but yeah, well, part of what we did here was to build smaller uh, high-performance computing so that we could run it. It's definitely computationally intensive. Um, I think that new uh, NVIDIA machine that you're talking about, I think... Uh, they should be happy to have this. I think that's what he wants us to do with this, is these kind of climate forecasts. All right, hang on. I gotta ask, is, is this offshore wind ready? You mean like? That, that it's able to um, uh, evaluate the consequence of offshore wind development. Um, no, it's not ready yet. I mean, I, the challenge there is, uh, characterizing the actual offshore wind farm that you want to. Um, but if we could, if you could describe that all, because that's really the challenge. Like what, how exactly does the wind farm interact with the hydrodynamics? That's the biggest, if you could do that locally, then I can tell you what it's gonna do in the lee of that. Um, but the hardest part about those simulations, because I've been involved in that in the, more on the wave energy side, not the offshore, the hardest and the most inaccurate part is the details of what happens around them. Because again, it's one of those things you have to study with more physics, figure out how to parameterize, and then you can take it to these larger scale models and make the larger scale forecasts. All right, last call for questions online. Last call for questions in the room. Wait a minute, it's coming. Good job. <laughs> Go ahead, Roseanne. Uh, two questions. If the 3D topography onshore and offshore being used to help to understand where erosions and depositions are, occur are, are occurring, uh, do you know what geologically is causing the reef offshore to exist. Right, those are two questions, right? Yeah. Um, well, let me take the second one. I don't, I'd ask a geologist why that reef is there. I'm sure someone has an idea. Uh, to be honest, I don't. I don't have a good answer for that one. And the first one was, are we moving the sediment around? He apologizes for our typos. I think it was erosions and deposits. Um, where where are they occurring? What's yeah. being used to help understand where they're occurring? That's what we're hoping to do. We're not doing that yet, but that would be one of the goals and purpose of putting together a system like this is to predict morphologic change, which is erosion and deposition. Uh, we're just not there yet. What is your timeline? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 
It's me. I was just asking, you were talking about that, you know, you're just kind of starting and you're, you have things that you're going to hope to, to roll into this. What is your timeline for um, the grant? It's a three-year grant and we're a year, year and a half into it. Um, uh, there's good reason to think it'll continue on past the three years, uh, but it's not written in stone. Um, and we like to be, uh, I would say the target is to being forecast, be able to do these water level kind of forecasts by the end of the three years. But all the sediment transport stuff is not part of the three year, uh, other than the dune grass, but not the uh, hydrodynamic moving of the underwater topography. That's not part of the three years. Um, thank you for a great presentation. I realized that the, probably at the small scale, the sediment changes. I don't know if it changes a lot at larger scale. In the same way that you have the library for the boundary forcing of your water level, could you have libraries of course profiles? Like, are there some years where the beach looks more a certain way and other years where it looks more another way in kind of the guiding principles or are they very different all the time? Yeah, you mean like make those, we did the categorization of the weather patterns, but uh, along with that, there's, you could categorize the beach profiles, interseasonal. Yeah, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Okay. All right, everybody. I think uh, we will say thank you very much to our speaker, Greg. Okay, for everybody online, hope to see you here next week. For everybody in the room, um, thank you for being here, and we will also see you next week. <laughs>